Cool. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, one of the, well, anyways, we'll get into it. But uh, yeah, so if you're here for CSE 365, you are in the correct place. There's a decent number of you in the audience. I think it's more than on Tuesday. So uh, that's good. So you may be wondering what is uh, going on with this course. So the first thing I want to cover is the course setup. Uh, so if you notice when you register for this course on my ASU or whatever, it says that it's a hybrid course. And so you signed up for a section that has half the number of in-person hours as everything else, right? So uh, you signed up for a Tuesday section from 9 a.m. to 10, 15, or most of you, it was a, um, Thursday section, could you hear right now, from 9 a.m. to 10.15. Uh, so what the hybrid means is basically half of your time is going to be in-class stuff and the other half is going to be online. The online stuff will occur Tuesdays at 9 a.m. to 10.15. So you can, uh, so you, I'm going to treat you all like you're in the Thursday class because the Tuesday class got this on Tuesday. So on Tuesday at 9 a.m., we're going to, um, start and continue from where we leave off today, continuing with content. And then from there, we'll continue that content on Thursday and so forth. So essentially you can think about it like you guys are sharing this room uh, because we have a roughly 250 students in each of the uh, sections. They actually physically don't have a room big enough to hold uh, the number of people in the two classes. Otherwise that's probably what we would do. Uh, but you're free to attend synchronously the Tuesday or Thursday sec section on Zoom. So we'll always have the Zoom available if. Uh, that's if it's not your section uh, and we'll also record all the videos and post them online so you can watch the videos watch them before your next class and you can also attend in person I mean I don't see even right now usually uh, I don't know what your experience is but I've seen like the, the most number of attendance is usually the first day of class and then any exams um, so if this is the most people we have you can feel free to attend in person if you want. If uh, there comes a situation where we're just bursting the capacity and we have to kick people out, if it's not your section that day, we'll ask you to uh, leave. But I highly doubt we'll be in that situation, but just uh, as a warning. Cool. Any questions on that? Yeah. No, this is the only week where we're covering the same content. So we're building off and we continue regular Tuesday, Thursday. So we'll cover stuff. We'll continue kind of the overview of security on Tuesday. And if we don't finish that, then we'll continue that on Thursday. And then we'll go to new content the next Tuesday. So it's, it's like a normal class. You're just switching in person versus online. I see another hand. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm not used to a room this big. It's really weird. Yeah. Uh, when we have exams, is it then the same on Thursday? We'll get into all the exams and all that stuff. So, yeah. But the content will be the assignments, exams. That, well, we don't have exams, but everything will be the same between both sections. And we won't treat you, I don't know. We don't, we actually don't even remember which section you're in until the end of the year when we have to put in grades separately into our separate sections. So, we're treating you like one giant class. Any other questions? And I will be. Okay. Cool. Uh, we'll get into the details. We have everything is available on the course website. That's where we're going to post all of our stuff. Uh, we're also going to use Piazza for discussions, but I'll get into that more when we talk about um, uh, the uh, when we get into the syllabus and everything. Um, question on the zoom why don't we use uh canvas uh because canvas is terrible so that's why we don't use it um, i don't know how it is for you but for me it's, it's literally one of the worst pieces of software i've ever used in my life so it's it's worthless and we can do a lot more and a lot cooler stuff outside of canvas so that's why we use all this other stuff because i think they're the best at what they do um, like piazza we always have a good uh I click on these things. I feel like we always have good uh, Piazza actually has really good discussions uh, and like the way you can do posting. You can do anonymous posts so that the other students don't know who you are. Uh, 
as a instructor, I can like endorse a student's answer. So it bubbles to the top so that everyone sees that like, yes, a instructor endorsed this. So uh, it's, it's really nice. It's actually really great for a large class like this because uh, what happens is basically, oh, how can we check our grades if they're not on campus? Um, as you'll see in the syllabus, there's not going to be a ton of assignments or um, exams. So theoretically, at any point in time, you should know your grade and be able to calculate it. Uh, to help with that and to help make sure that we know what grade we both agree on what you got on assignments, uh, throughout the course of the semester, we'll email you every student in the class your grade. So you get an email and said, hey, on assignment this, we have you for this. On assignment this, we have you for this. And we'll do that also after the, um, the midterm CTF and after the final CTF. And so you'll know your final grades kind of throughout the time. All right. Any questions? Yep. So, uh, how so, uh... No, that's up to you. So I think um, the benefit would be like right now I'm watching the Zoom chat. So if you're attending remotely, I'll be able, we'll be able to answer your questions um, during the chat. Uh, so that's the benefit. Otherwise, yeah, you're free to. We'll, we'll try to have the recordings up as soon as possible. Sometimes it gets weird with editing and stuff, but. Uh, we'll and I'll show you where it is on the course website, but we'll we'll continually post the the recordings there. Cool. All right. Uh, so now that we got that course stuff out of the way, a little bit of introduction about myself. I'm uh, Adam Dupe. You can uh, refer to me as Adam. That's kind of what I prefer, but whatever you can, I guess whatever you want to call me is also fine. I have to keep hitting this uh, admit button. That is going to be annoying. Okay, uh, I did my PhD at, uh, at UC Santa Barbara. I actually did a four plus one, so I did an undergrad plus a master's there, basically the equivalent of ASU's four plus one program. After that, I um, got a job at Microsoft working full time. I was like, I'm never going back to academia. I'm going to make tons of money, and. Um, I really liked it at Microsoft, but I really missed doing research. I got involved with research during my master's year. And so that's why I went back to UCSD for my PhD. Um, there, I was there for uh, four years and then graduated, got a job here at ASU. And that was uh, a long time ago. So um, I kind of got into security actually by playing in capture the flag competitions, which is going to be a theme and things that we'll see in this course. Um, so I originally started playing CTF with Shellfish, a, a CTF team that was started at UC Santa Barbara. And then I helped kind of reform the Pwn Devils um, CTF team at ASU, which has now essentially Pwn Devils uh, merged with Shellfish. So Shellfish is now like a multi-institutional beast. And uh, ASU also kind of, Pwn Devils also created the ASU Hacking Club, which if you're interested, you can find out more information uh, at their website. Uh, I'll have office hours on Tuesdays from 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. It's all on the website. We'll show you in a second. And my office hours, you can go in person if you want to uh, Brickyard 472, or you can always attend on Zoom. So part of what we're trying to do this semester is accommodate both. So, you know, I think almost everything will have a Zoom option, and each person's office hours will say if they're meeting in person or just on Zoom. All right. Tiffany, are you there? Can't actually see the. Uh... Okay. I wonder if she texted me that she's. Oh. All right. Cool. Okay. So uh, the professor of the uh, Tuesday section is Tiffany Bow. So one of the things we're doing by merging this uh, course together is. Um, we can actually kind of divide the content so we can each teach the, teach the content that we're best at. So um, for instance, I am really bad at cryptography and mathematics in general, whereas Tiffany is a crypto expert. Uh, I'll get into some things that she's done, but as part of our um, CTS that we've organized, she's created um, some uh, quantum cryptography challenges and uh, all kinds of cool stuff. So 
You're going to learn a ton of cool stuff from her on crypto and other things. Uh, a little bit about her background. She's currently an assistant professor here in uh, Sky. I guess we should update this. She did her PhD at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, which is a very cool and good school. They also have one of the top uh, capture the flag teams in uh, PPP, the Plaid Parliament of Coning. Uh, her research covers really cool stuff. So we actually do, um, we collaborate a lot. So she works on software security. So how to automatically find bugs and vulnerabilities of programs, but also going to a higher level and, and analyzing kind of the cybersecurity landscape from a game theory level. Uh, one of the coolest things that uh, Tiffany did was look for me in a corner. Chat here. Go off. Um, a paper that I think won Tiffany an award from the NSA was looking at um, the ability to quickly ricochet exploits. So if somebody sends an exploit to your system, uh, if you technically had the ability to take that and reflect it back at them, what would that mean for the cybersecurity landscape? So if you think it actually gives, um, and what she found is by analyzing it from a mathematical game theory perspective, uh, she was able to show that uh, it actually incentivizes a large, uh, large entity like the United States who has a lot of assets. So if they were to launch an attack at a small company who has a small number of assets, and that company or that country was able to quickly turn around and reflect it back to the United States, uh, that would cause more damage than the damage to the original country. So what she showed is it actually incentivizes uh, disclosure of vulnerabilities so that a country like the United States, rather than using that exploit for offensive purposes, would decide to fix it and disclose it to everyone so that everyone knows about it and they can fix it, which is a really cool result. Um, so yeah, so for office hours on the website, um, we also have a number of uh, TAs and undergrad TAs. Um, they're named on the website where I just met some of my nice, uh, if you're an undergrad TA, you want to stand up. I know there's like at least four of you. Look, you can actually meet them and see them in person. I feel really bad. I only know the, uh, from last year, I went to the handles of the undergrad TAs that I work with. Okay. And this is kind of a little bit of some fun stuff to talk about some of the things that Tiffany and I kind of get into. Uh, one of the things we're really passionate about is uh, capture the flag competitions, which you can think of as ethical hacking competitions where organizers put together kind of puzzles. So they create custom pieces of software that have some vulnerabilities, and then the teams compete against each other, race to identify the problem, the bug in the code, write an exploit, and usually launch it at the other teams to steal some flag, which they give the organizers for points. And so there's actually a number of CTFs throughout the year. I think there's almost one every weekend if you want to get crazy about it. Um, and the what I think of as the kind of premier and top capsule flag competition is uh, co-located with the DEF CON security Con uh, cybersecurity conference. So DEF CON is a conference that happens every August in Las Vegas. Uh, question, why would you have a, have you ever been to Las Vegas in August? We've all been to Phoenix in August, right? What's the defining feature of Phoenix in August? Somebody didn't say it loud enough. Hot, hot, right? Is Vegas any different? No. So why do you want to hold a conference where 30,000 people from around the world go to Vegas in the summer? No rain? <laughs> You're inside all the time. Why do you care about rain? Yeah, ooh, uh, somebody has it on the uh, on the chat in Zoom. Yeah, cheap rooms. So the hotels are actually cheaper, actually just like in Phoenix, right? During the summer months, you can go to resorts for pretty cheap because nobody actually wants to come here. Um, so similar mindset, you can host a conference for pretty cheap. So the DEF CON conference is kind of like still has this underground flavor where you can buy a uh, pass for the conference for, I think it's $300 of cash money. So they, they, you have to buy it in person with cash. You can't use a credit card. So there's no trace of anything. Like it's very much a cool kind of uh, cyberpunk thing. And co-located with that, and, uh, over time, this kind of capture the flag event organically was created at DEF CON that then a series of organizers throughout the years have taken up the mantle of creating this competition. So Tiffany and I are members of one of the teams that have done that. So the Order of the Overflow, that's our team name. 
And this is from DEF CON 27, which is one of my favorite ones. It was the last one we had fully in person in 2019. And so the way that works is basically throughout the year, um, usually about, uh, so the organizers will designate six other capture the flags and say the winner of that event gets to qualify. And then also, so in addition to this final CTF, the organizers also host a fully online um, 48 hour capture the flag event, which is called the qualification event. So in, uh, in that year, we had 1200 teams from around the world compete in our qualification event in May. Uh, of, and this qualification event, you'll actually become very familiar with this style of capture the flag because our assignments are gonna be based around this. Um, and what we, what we do here is we have, um, so these are kind of, the reason kind of why it's jeopardy is you can kind of uh, select any of these challenges that may be worth different points and you're all trying to solve this puzzle so maybe it's uh like on the right here is the category oh, let's see there's anything yeah web so there's a web challenge uh although that was a bad example of that challenge oh there's a crypto challenge that time again uh, there's a crypto one maybe it's a crypto thing maybe it's uh a service running somewhere that they say, hey, uh, this IP address in this port is this binary running. And that's all the information you're given. So you have to analyze the binary, find the vulnerability, exploit it, steal the flag, submit it here for points. And in this competition, so this is a 48 hour straight competition. It was actually kind of the same, but the uh, winning team was PDP, uh, the CMU team that uh, Tiffany was a member of. And they just solved a ton of stuff. They actually dominated this year. Uh, and in fifth place uh, was Shellfish, our, our old team. And so we selected basically from the qualifying event and other CTFs, the top 16 teams in the world were uh, invited to the final event where they packed in person. And for this final event, rather than the Jeopardy style, it was what's known as an attack defense CTF, where you have to, uh, basically every team is essentially running uh, their own machine that is running custom services written by us, the organizers. So they have to analyze vulnerabilities in those services, um, write exploits for them, launch the exploits at the other teams, steal their flags, and also patch their own vulnerabilities to fix them. And so this was kind of a uh, what it looked like in person. So uh, one of the things that's deceptive here, each uh, team area has eight uh, people in it at max. And uh, <laughs> it turns out, uh, well, many of these teams have much, much, much more. So they'll often have like teams in a hotel room of 10, 20, 30. I've even heard rumors up to like 60 or 70 people uh, playing. And this I like, uh, oh, I don't know how loud this is gonna be, but we'll see. Oh, um, so this is kind of gives you a visual representation. You can see that this was in 2019 because nobody's wearing a mask. Um, and this was kind of, we were part of uh, DEF CON there. And like people would come and walk around and kind of see what the people were doing. Uh, one of the really cool, one of the really cool challenges uh, that we did was, was on the, so the way this is structured time-wise is it's over the course of three days. So it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 10 hours of game time on Friday, 10 hours of game time on Saturday, and four hours of game time on Sunday for 24 hours total. And on Saturday, the team showed up and we handed every captain an original Xbox with a controller, power supply. And we said, there's a cable at each of your tables. Plug the Xbox into the cable. And that's all we told them. So what would happen is when they, and you can see kind of their uh, surprise in their faces. Uh, what would happen when they booted that up? So uh, we had one of the guys on our team is really into the original Xbox. Like he helps with the, uh, emulating and running like old Xbox games on modern hardware. So he's really familiar with uh, the old hardware. He was able to port Doom to run, which is an old computer game, to run on the original Xbox. And so what would happen is you turn the Xbox on, it would be connected over the network. It would actually download the Doom game from our systems onto theirs, run it, and then they would be playing about every 10 minutes a capture the flag game within our capture the flag game. And the person who won that round would get points and then that would keep going. But one of the first things they noticed is when they started the game, you could run around, but you can't shoot. 
So it's really kind of hard to uh, capture a flag if you can't keep anybody away. So what they actually had to do was um, reverse engineer the game and basically use game hacking skills to, as the game was downloaded from us, change the bits and bytes of the game to allow them things like shooting and to allow them. And then beyond that, there was a number of bugs in our implementation so that they could uh, walk through walls so that they could move faster than they were supposed to. Um, it was uh, all kinds of really cool stuff. The unintended thing that we didn't realize what happened is, is anybody a uh, professional or a really good Doom player? Like maybe does speed runs in their free time? It's okay, you can tell us later anonymously on Yatsa and link to your video. Um, yeah, we, we didn't think so either. It turns out there are these kind of people and they were playing on some of the CTF teams. So once they were able to hack the game enough to shoot, they just sat their best Doom player in front of it and they played Doom for like four hours straight. And it was actually a pretty effective technique to uh, get points uh, until some of the other teams started finding the complex bugs. So that was an interesting kind of uh, unintended side effect here. And okay. And then so some of the other things that the teams did that year. So if you remember, we made this challenges. Uh, one of the things was we made an iOS application that was like Telegram. And uh, they had to hack it was running on a real iOS device. So they had to find vulnerabilities in that, hack everybody's apps. Uh, it was pretty cool. They um, we incorporated elements of machine learning. So I believe this one was essentially, um, I think this one was something like uh, we trained a neural network trained to recognize the flag. And then based on the weights in the neural network, you can actually reverse engineer and figure out what the flag was that it was trying to detect. Um, and there's interesting ways to obfuscate this to make this more difficult. And that's what the teams had to do to basically catch. Um, the challenge that I created this year was really fun. So. Um, uh, so Lisp is a uh, one of the earliest programming languages, and back in like the, well, I think it was like the 60s, uh, yeah, back in the 80s, there was companies that were like, Lisp is the future, so we should have a CPU that rather than running x86 or whatever code, runs Lisp microcode, so that that way the machine, we can write the operating system in Lisp, everything in Lisp, and it runs in this machine. Uh, they have emulators for this, so I wrote a uh, web server with a vulnerability in it, so the teams had to like decompile a a uh, de uh, decompile this file, which was in a list machine microcode, to figure out what was going on, and then uh, eventually uh, exploit it. So uh, yeah, um, PVP did really good in this one. That's actually kind of why they won because they were the first. I think almost only people to do this. Uh, yeah, the other interesting thing that maybe has actual real world applications. So the term shell coding is important. We'll get into it later. But basically, the idea of this challenge was, hey, how do we write something, some code, so some binaries, ones and zeros that are executed by the CPU, where if you flipped random bits from a zero to a one or a one to zero, it would still work. And one of the teams actually was able to write, I think, a like. I think it was like 1024 or something bit uh, shell code where you could flip all of the bits and it would still execute correctly. Not, not like flip all of them, but you could flip every single bit, switch it, run it, it would still work. Do the next one, run it, still work. Next one, run it, still work. Uh, why might that be useful? Does that have any real world applications? Yeah. Yeah, maybe network transmission errors. That's a good one where a lot of times where bit flips occur over network transmissions. What else? Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like sci-fi, right? So um, one of the um, <laughs> one of the stories I was told by a computer architecture professor was that the let's say the army. I don't know which branch, but let's say the army had commissioned these huge machines to run some computations. And they had built two identical machines, but one had twice the error rate of the other one. So they kept replacing parts, trying to debug, trying to figure out why it had a higher error rate. The difference was one facility with the lower error rate was located at the sea level, and the other one was up in the mountains. 
and they realized it was actually cosmic uh, like gamma rays or whatever that hit and if it hits memory in the right place it can cause a bit flip and that actually caused the error so by uh, using i think lead so they like lined the uh, computer with lead or whatever that actually prevented and then the error rates were exactly the same for those two machines um, so if you think about just from like sea level to mountain level that could cause things imagine what happens with satellites in space right so bit flips are actually very common there and you have to get um i think they call it rad safe like radiation safe hardware which is super cheap or sorry super expensive and super slow compared to commodity hardware so if you're able to actually create some kind of coding scheme that can survive a couple bit flips that's actually really helpful uh, in space because maybe you don't need the super expensive components cool so the team's played for a while um there was actually a lot of attacking going on it was kind of crazy um overall at the end of the day uh, so these we had three we kind of graded them on three different categories one was attack one was defense and the other was this kind of king of the hill style challenges which was like the which the doom game was one of these king of the hill style things and there's you know we have ways to score them but in the end uh, pvp won uh, which was super cool and so we got to present them with oh i forgot to say the uh, the thing that these people actually win so the defcon conference what they do is the winner the winning team of the CTF wins eight uh, black badges, what they call. So a black badge gives you free access to DEF CON for life. And so, yeah, it's a super prestigious thing and people can tell when you wear it around the conference. Like it's, uh, it's really cool. So uh, PPP won that that year. That was really awesome. Uh, I wanted to, <laughs> and then these are, um, these are uh, pictures from this year. So this was uh, 2021 in August. And um, so there's a couple of interesting parallels between this and what we're doing here. Uh, so this year, so in 2020, DEF CON was completely online and virtual. So we ran our virtual uh, capture the flag. That was really difficult dealing with time zones of all the teams. So we had this horrible schedule where we invented a like 28 hour day. So the teams would play for eight hours, sleep for four, or not sleep for four, but the game would go down for four hours, up for eight hours, down for four, up for eight hours, down for four. That way every team had a crap time where it was like 1 a.m. their time, but it just wasn't inherently unfair. Uh, turns out the teams hated that. So uh, yeah, nobody likes, uh, and we hated it too, because like we had no time to sleep. You'd like go take a nap for two hours, wake up, and then have to administer this game for another eight hours. Uh, so. So uh, in 2021, the DEF CON conference was hybrid, so in-person and virtual, and our CTF was hybrid. So some teams were there in person, some teams were remote. Our team itself was in-person and remote. And one of the things I want that we should keep in mind here, um, you and me as well, is that actually what I found was hybrid was more difficult than being completely virtual. Because being completely virtual, Everyone was virtual, so it was kind of, there were, there were definitely pain points, like we had uh, one guy on our team, uh, his challenge, well, it ended up being not uh, exploitable, so the compiler was doing something weird and he didn't prove that it was actually exploitable, and we kept trying to get a hold of him, but we couldn't get a hold of him because he'd fallen asleep on a stupid like pillow uh, that he had, but nobody was where he lived to go and wake him up, uh, which we would have done in person, so uh, yeah, that was definitely a problem, but being hybrid is actually more difficult because we had to deal with our team members that were remote, but also here and any announcements that we made, we'd have to make virtual and in person. So um, yeah, just keep that in mind as we're, you know, uh, even just here, like um, maybe it's because I'm more in practice with running uh, on completely online classes uh, from the last couple of years, but it's uh it's actually more difficult having the zoom like keeping track of the chat and keeping track of who needs to be admitted into the zoom meeting while also looking at the nice people that are here i love having you here because i like seeing your faces and like you nod sometimes or slightly laugh when i make a joke uh it's much better than the silence on zoom when i make a joke and i don't know if anybody thinks it's funny so uh, i like it but yeah just keep you know keep that in mind as we're going forward it's going to be a adventure for all of us uh, just like it was an adventure for me. So uh, this was, I think after an all-nighter I had pulled from like Friday to Saturday, where I just set up a bunch of stuff and I was the only one who could do it. And I just 
actually stayed in this big room in a giant uh, conference center with the AC blasting. So by the morning time when Jan came in, so that's uh, Jan Shushashvili, he teaches 466. Uh, he was trying to warm me up by putting a tablecloth over me. And I guess he didn't need massages. I only have like vague memories of this. Uh, the problem was that I was trying to get some other things set up and I just couldn't. And at one point I just took a nap underneath the table there. Um, it was one of these things where it's like, I didn't want to run to the hotel room because that had happened our first year in 2018. I was like, guys, I'm so wait, I'm so tired. I need to like leave and take a nap. So I left this time we were in a hotel across the way. So I had to walk all the way to our hotel, sat down and was just trying to fall asleep when Jan called me. I was like, uh, so the database, like something is wrong with the database. And I tried to like tell him this command to run and he, it wasn't fixing it. So I had to just get up and come all the way back. So uh, this way I was like, all right, I can sleep under the table. And that way if anybody needs me, they'll just like shake me awake and I'll be awake and fix things. Uh, luckily I had my revenge because that night, Saturday, Jan uh, stayed up the whole night to implement some stuff uh, for Sunday morning. And when we showed up, he was like curled up like a little baby under the thing here. It was uh, really fun. Uh, and so this was our fourth year hosting and we realized, you know what? This is way too much work. So we are done hosting DEF CON. Uh, I'm actually super excited about this because it took up uh, way, way, way too much time. Um, and I'll get to play now in the, the CTS. So this was us at the closing ceremonies when Jan is telling us. Uh, so that's Jan, that's me. I think I don't want to spoil anybody's identity if they don't want to be uh, spoiled. Uh, and unfortunately, Tiffany um, didn't get to participate this much in 2021 because she was busy making a baby. So uh, this is uh, little baby Alan. Um, so Tiffany has, uh, yeah, so he's super cute. Uh, I've met him a few times. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Anyways. Um, I don't know what to say about babies. Uh, all right, cool. So, okay. So kind of, okay, that's what we did, uh, kind of setting the stage of CTFs, why they're important. I think they're super important because they get you into, they really give you the hands-on security skills that you need to you know, get a job, not just get a job, but also to really understand things. Uh, the things I like to say is that I could sit up here and teach you the theory about buffer overflows, and I've done it long enough that I guarantee all of you will understand the theory by the time we're done with that. But until you actually go to your computer and really exploit a buffer overflow, you really don't understand what's going on there and all the things. And, and it helps you learn much more about computers and how they work. And that's kind of what we're going to be doing in this class is really understanding those things. Um, so if you want to get more into security, we have two uh, undergrad cybersecurity concentrations. A concentration actually shows up on your degree, so it says concentration in cybersecurity. Uh, we also have graduate programs um, where you can also get a cybersecurity consultation. If you want more information about it, uh, feel free to ask me. Um, so the concentration in BS, you need to take 15 credits. Uh, you are required to take CSE 365. And guess what? By May, you'll all have taken CSE 365. So check mark done. You're already actually essentially a third of the way through. So then you choose two from these the other classes, 466 is the course that Jan teaches. I actually think there's some crazy people who've taken that before taking 365. Is that what I saw? Um, I don't think that should is possible, should be possible. But whatever, what do I know? Um, uh, 468 is network security, 469 is a forensics course. Um, so you choose two of those. So the idea is to give you choice so you can kind of dive into whatever area interests you most. Uh, we have some really cool faculty that are starting this year that work on things like privacy, adversarial machine learning. And so I think over time we'll have those, those uh, other classes. I don't know if it's time for you, but in general. And then you just take two elective courses that you probably would have taken anyway, but from a list that's like cybersecurity related. Um, so actually the lift here is pretty easy for, for y'all since you already are taking uh, 365. Um, yeah, we kind of know what we're doing, I guess. Uh, we've been recognized by the NSA and DHS as a uh, National Center, Center of Academic Excellence in uh, Information Assurance Education. And now for the fun part.
Anybody have any questions on anything I discussed so far? Don't ask me questions about Tiffany's baby. I can't. You can feel free to like speak up if I don't see your hand up or whatever. It's hard to monitor the things. All right. Okay, uh, cool. So the basic idea of this course is, so uh, information assurance is kind of the older term for cybersecurity. They, I guess, technically kind of mean slightly different things, but also not really. So it's not worth uh, thinking about the differences. You can just think about them as kind of the same thing. So cybersecurity, information assurance, um, is kind of the same thing. So what we're going to basically be doing is covering, so the idea of this course is it's a breadth uh, course of cybersecurity. So cybersecurity touches on a ton of different areas. And so we're going to kind of give you a sampling of each area. Like for instance, and if you're more interested in it and we offer um, uh, uh, 400 level courses on that, then you, um, then you can choose to take those courses. So we're, when we go over binary analysis and uh, reverse engineering and exploits and those kinds of things, if that's what you're really into, then you can take 466 where they do that for an entire semester and that gets really beaten uh, into you. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the goals here. Um, and we're also focusing on kind of holistically things. So we're gonna talk about things about like policy and management, legality, ethics. Uh, ethics is a thing that comes up a lot. Um, the prereqs are probably not to cover because I don't think you can register for the course without them. So uh, we have a, so there is a textbook it's recommended, which means, hey, if you want to get it, go ahead. It's this book. We'll, what we'll do is for each uh, for each topic that we talk about, we'll link two sections in that book where you can read more things. I mean, I, well, I think Tim and I do an okay job teaching, right? We, our style may not be for everyone. So if you want different ways of interpreting and understanding the material, feel free to get the book. It's a great book um, if you want to read it. But we won't be giving, you know, we won't be assigning readings out of the book. You can get everything you need from this class just from the lectures. Uh, so it's really up to you if you want to use the book. Questions on the book? All right, cool. Uh, yeah, we, yes. uh, we will use a Piazza for everything. So for all course communication. So when we make announcements, we'll announce them here in Piazza. Um, it is your responsibility to keep up to date with those things. It's not our responsibility. So what we will do is make sure that we announce communications there. It's a, one of the actual great, well, one of the great things about having such a large course and, um, and even merging them is that uh, almost every question that you have, somebody else has already had that same question. And so having some place like Piazza where we can have, and when students can ask questions, they, other students can answer. Like this is incredibly helpful for all of you in, you know, figuring out programming problems or understanding concepts, all these kinds of things. Like it really is like, this is uh, actually a great strength is being able to help each other and, and benefit from each other's knowledge. So highly encourage you to do that. Uh, there's also a course discord that so the students created uh, that Tiffany and I are on. Um, that's not a, like, I guess, officially endorsed by us. Maybe we will, I don't know. But uh, if you want to join that, that's also a good way. I think we'll try to work out something there. It was really, we used it pretty successfully in spring 21. The undergrad TAs were involved as well and could, uh, could do a lot of different things uh, and help there. So that's another good way. But it, uh, the problem is it doesn't have the, uh, the kind of staying power, it's, it's much more difficult, I feel like, to search for questions in like previously asked questions in Discord. So often what happens is people ask the same question over and over and over again, and then we continually link them to like the FAQ or the Piazza post that answers the question. Uh, cool. Now, this may be something that I don't know whether you've thought about before, how to ask a question. Um, and before you even think about this, this is not necessarily something that um, is intuitive or easy. 
you know, but if you think about it, you can ask the question like, hey, my code doesn't compile. Okay, like what are you using a hammer to compile it? Like what's what's going on? Like I have I have no details to help you answer that question. Um, and I honestly like I know it may be difficult for you to uh, believe this, but Tiffany and I are actually humans and we we respond when when we see that students are trying, we actually try really hard to help them. If it seems like you're not really trying, it becomes slightly more difficult. We will still probably help you, but it may be not as much in-depth help as we would give somebody who we see is putting in the effort. So that's part of, if you've never read this uh, doc, how to ask questions a smart way, I highly, highly, highly recommend you uh, review this because it talks about these kinds of things of how to ask questions to actually get a good answer back. So some of the things is, the things that I'm talking about, demonstrating that, so being precise, right? Rather than, hey, my code doesn't compile, what's the error message, right? What's the error you're giving? What's the command you're using to compile? Um, those are things that are very helpful to help you. And the other thing that's really important, the third thing is, what is, what have you done to try to solve the problem, right? If I can take that error message, put it into Google, send you the first stack overflow result, it means that you're not really putting in the effort you need to solve your problem. Uh, no joke, every time I'm coding something, I am constantly Googling the errors that I find and hit. Like this happens to me all the time. Like, I don't just write out code that's perfect, hit compile, it compiles, and then it runs with no bugs. I'm constantly hitting problems and learning things. And so developing that skill as a computer scientist, as a software developer, to be able to go and find things that exist to solve your problems, is incredibly helpful and will be an asset to you throughout your career. So this is part of why we're doing this, not just to make our lives better, but really to help develop you and part of your communication skills as a developer. Um, so yeah, so being able to, to so read through this doc is super handy, super helpful. Um, and, and yeah, so that all those things will help us help you and help you help each other because you'll find as well when people post the octopuses that are like dude this question was either answered in the assignment or answered like five times already in piazza like you as students can see that as well and so uh, just don't don't be that person be that night you know that's not to say don't ask questions always ask questions we're here to learn we're here to help uh but put in the effort to help teach yourself and then when you get stuck and you say hey my code's not compiling i'm using this gcc command it's giving me this error message. I Googled and I found these links and this thing says I'm not using the right library, but that doesn't make sense because I'm not using the library. And this other link says to do this other thing. And so I've run out of options of, of what things to try. And oftentimes, um, I think some students uh, get kind of annoyed with uh, my style of answering questions because oftentimes I will very rarely answer your question directly. I will ask you a question to help guide you to the answer, right? Part of that is helping to teach you the questions to ask yourself in order to get to the right answer. Because I've been doing this a long time. I've seen almost every possible mistake that students can make. Actually, my favorite time is when a student has a problem that I've never seen before. Because then I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Let's dig in and figure out what's going on. And then when I do that, I learn something. Uh, but oftentimes it's things that I see over and over again. And so, if you have a question, you come to me, I give you answer, you, that solves your problem. But when you get into that same situation again, or a slightly different one, you don't know what to do. So part of what my style is, is to ask you questions, to, to get you thinking about things that are the, in the correct path to get you to the solution. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it'll be frustrating, but it's good for you in the long run. I guess you'll just have to trust me on that. Okay, uh, other thing we'll get into it with the um, with the plagiarism, but uh, you know, definitely ask tons of questions, help each other, but just don't share code. So that's that's where we draw the line. When you're sharing code, that's when it gets dicey, and we'll talk about that later in uh, the plagiarism parts. Um, and you can act like me. You can say, okay, uh, it's better to point out a mistake or. Uh, saying like, oh, it's not compiling because you're missing a semicolon, probably, because I've seen that. Like, you should, rather than saying like, oh, there's a semicolon missing on line 53, like, add this and everything will be magically fixed. Um, 
it's usually much better to point them to something that will help them fix the problem rather than uh, just giving them the answer. Okay. Uh, the other thing, two things here. Um, Tiffany, and I, I was, Tiffany and I get a lot of email, like a lot of email. Like uh, I have currently 700 unread emails in my inbox. It's just like impossible to keep up with everything. I have random people emailing me. Other, anyways. So while we try to, we will try desperately to respond to all of your emails. It's it's uh, very possible that something will slip through if you just email us. So this is why Piazza is great. If you make a private Piazza post, it just comes to the professors and and the TAs and not the undergrad TAs. So um, so please do that if it's something private. If we deem that it's actually not quite private, or if you email us, one of the benefits of Piazza is everyone gets to learn from that answer. So if you just email us and we just respond to you, that doesn't really, nobody's benefiting from that interaction. So uh, oftentimes what we'll do is actually rip out your question, create a Piazza post with that question, put our answer in. And obviously, um, and of course, if it's something personal, we won't do that, right? Or oftentimes what I'll do is anonymize the person's name. Uh, so nobody actually knows who asked that question. Uh, but yeah, if you have something personal or private or medical related or whatever, um, definitely talk to us about it. You can make a Piazza post, a uh, private one, obviously, or email us directly. That's also good. Questions on course communication? All right. Topics. We're going to cover a lot of stuff. Uh, this is kind of what I meant. We're going to cover a lot of different things. Access control to cryptography, authentication, network security, system security, binary security, uh, all kinds of cool stuff. We'll touch on legality, ethical uh, problems. All right. Like I mentioned at the start, we're, um, we're not going to have any exams. We did this, experimented with this last year. I think it was pretty useful. So there'll be homework assignments and capture the flag competitions. So we're not quite sure yet exactly how many assignments we're going to have for the course. It'll be more clear as we kind of go through it. This actually depends a bit on how fast we get through content. And it's all about kind of navigating the assignments we give versus the capital flags and all that kind of thing. Uh, so there will be a midterm CTF and a final CTF. This will be essentially in lieu of exams. You can think of it as like a take home exam. It's an exam for you that have challenges that exercise things that we've used in the course. Um, so you're going to work on it individually. Oh yeah, Tiffany just spoke on Tuesday. It's a week long, so we'll give you a week uh, for each of these. And this way you can do it at your leisure. You also, due to the nature of the capture the flag, you know you're great on that all the time because you will see, oh, I, we will tell you, hey, each uh, challenge is worth what, whatever, 10, 15, 20 points. And so you'll know, hey, I solved this many, I have 70 or I have 80 or whatever. And so you can decide, hey, do I wanna keep going and get 100 or 110? Uh, or do I want, am I okay with this and just stop? So same with the final, final CTF, it'll just be towards the end of the semester, obviously, and be cumulative with everything we did. So grading the grades, uh, it'll be mostly homework assignments. So weighted towards homework, 70%. Uh, midterm CTF 10 and final CTF 20. Any questions on these things? Cool. And okay, the grade thresholds. So again, you have complete knowledge of how to calculate your scores. You know the weighting of assignments. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sure. I don't know 100%. Uh, midterms, no, because I can't guarantee what other people are going to do. So I don't know when they do their midterms. I think, I don't know. I have to look at what we did last year, and I don't want to commit to anything right now without talking to Tiffany about things. Uh, I, and you can look. So at the top of the website, there's the archive link to spring 2021, where you can actually look at, at what it was uh, last year, what the duration was. I think we had our. Yeah, I don't know. Actually, I, I literally no memory of this. So. I know it happened. That's what I do. 
Okay, yeah, good question. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, the curve. So, anyways, so you have full knowledge to calculate your grades, you know the weighting, you know the um, uh, you'll and you also know the uh, thresholds here. So um, what we're guaranteeing is if you get a 90% or higher, like if you get a 90%, that is an A minus. It will always be an A minus. We're never going to say a 90% is now a B plus. So we'll never raise those uh, curves up, but we may raise them down if we see fit. So you may get an 89.9. Normally that would be an A and that would be a B plus because there is no rounding. There's plenty of extra credit opportunities. Uh, but we may, for whatever reason, see, hmm, maybe we should drag down that thing so that now 87% uh, uh, is a B plus, uh, is an A minus or something like that. It rarely happens. It's not going to happen too crazy, but this gives us the ability. So that way, you're always guaranteed whatever grade you think you have is at least that. Uh, I see the screen on my iPad. Okay. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Yeah, okay. Homework due dates and exams. So, homework due dates will be uh, posted in advance on the course website, announcing class, also on Piazza. Um, you can submit late. So, each day that an assignment is late, it'll be deduced 20%. So, if you submit it from one minute late to 24, 23 hours and 59 minutes late, then it'll be 20% off, then 40%, then 60%, then 80%, then 100%, in which case it's worth nothing. Right? Um, we'll get into the specifics here as we go forward. Uh, typically, I think it depends on the assignment, but usually whatever part of the assignment it is, uh, you'll that part will be reduced. So if it's a four-point part assignment and you do three parts beforehand, those grades don't get affected by doing the last part the day late. And you also get the highest possible score so that you've gotten so far. So if you were able to get 75% before the deadline, but even going late, you weren't able to break that, like whatever your highest score was, and you will know. No, assignment due dates will not be listed on Canvas. We do not use Canvas for anything. The only thing we're using Canvas for is to point you to that website. Okay. The other thing that is a policy that uh, actually will hopefully make your life better. Uh, I was a student once. I know it's hard to imagine, but uh, and I understand that students start things late, especially um, oftentimes students who think they're uh, really good will start late and then realize, oh shoot, this is a really complex uh, project and not be able to finish it in time. Uh, what this leads to is a lot of pressure on us and the TAs and the undergrad TAs about people asking questions and demanding help as we get closer and closer to the deadline. Um, so what we uh, so what we instituted last year that was really helpful for everyone was basically a help a homework help blackout. So like six hours before that, and you have at least a week, if not two weeks, on your assignments. So. Uh, what we do is six hours before the deadline, so the deadline's at midnight at 6 p.m. We're going to say, all right, unless there's like massive problems, like if the server goes down or whatever, like we're not, like don't expect any response on any help questions. Uh, you're still free to help each other. That's, that's totally fine. It's just from the uh, undergrad TAs, the TAs, and the uh, professors. Uh, we will not be answering stuff. Okay. Uh, if you have any special accommodations, we are happy to uh, support those. So feel free to let us know about that. Um, we'll make whatever arrangements are necessary. Uh, okay, I hate to do this, but it happens all the time. So um, plagiarism is actually a serious deal. Uh, at a uh, part of what I like to think is, and it is true, what you're doing now is kind of practicing and developing your skills so that you know, you can get a job in the future. And uh, if you're not actually doing those skills and you're just copying from somebody else, then you're cheating yourself out of the practice you need to get better at getting those jobs. Um, in addition, the thing that really bugs me is, because uh, I used to teach, has anybody taken like 340? Some people? Okay, cool. Yeah, um, I used to teach uh, 340 for a while. And uh, I had students who tried super hard, like, 
would work on this, be in every single office hour, do the assignments, work you know, 10, 20, 30 hours a week on the assignments and still get a C. And then I had other students who would copy from people and get an A and not work hard. And so uh, that, that part really bugs me. Uh, so that's why I, you know, we take uh, plagiarism super seriously. I don't want to do it, but when I do it, I will. Like if I see it, if, when we see it, we will do stuff about it. So, um, so read the stuff if you're unclear about this. Uh, you can use code snippets. We're also not silly. Like I use code snippets all the time. I Google something, find something on Stack Overflow, copy it, paste it in. That's actually part of the natural development environment. What you should do and what your responsibility is, just like when you're writing an English paper, if you're borrowing words from somebody else, you cite them so that it's clear that you're not claiming these words as your own. You're saying they came from another source. So all you need to do is put a comment that says, this comes from this, boom, this URL, and that's it. And that way, when we run our stuff and we see, hey, the code, hmm, the code matches somebody else, we can see, oh yeah, these functions are both from that, um, that Stack Overflow article. Great, no academic integrity issues here. And uh, zero tolerance policy. So this is just helpful to talk about. So uh, we will report any incidents we see to the Dean's office. Uh, the Dean's office keeps a list of this so that if you're a repeat offender, the penalty goes up significantly. Uh, and that's because uh, if you don't report it, then the people who do this do it again. So even if they get a, a zero on an assignment in one class, if it's not tracked, um, then it's a bad deal. So examples that are not limited to these examples, uh, sharing code with a fellow student, uh, collaborating on code with a fellow student. So this means don't post your code when you're having problems on the thing. I have to yell at people, oh, it's about a few times a year um, on Discord and Piazza, where it's like, whoa, that's way too much code to share. Like, just talk about the problems you're having and people can definitely help you out. Uh, submitting another student's code is your own. You may think this is silly, I've seen this with the other student's name and ASU ID as a comment in the file. Uh, this also extends to past years as well. So submitting a prior student's code as your own is also academic integrity violation for you and the other student. Guess what? We can go back and fail them too. I don't want to, so don't do it. Um, this is another important thing that a lot of students don't uh, think about is uh, posting your assignment code online is forbidden. So. Don't post your assignment code to GitHub and then complain when somebody else submits that as their code. This has also happened to me. Uh, both students got in trouble as if they shared code in the first place uh, because it's your responsibility to uh, safeguard your code. Uh, a lot of students say, oh, but Adam, I'm trying to build a, a, a GitHub profile that shows employers that I can code. Um, and usually what I say to that is, uh, honestly, employers don't care about the code you write in class, because guess what? Everyone writes that code. Every single employee that applies to their jobs has written those to that code. If you want to impress employers, you should do something outside of a classroom or an extension or something that's maybe related to an assignment, but not the assignment itself. That actually speaks volumes with employers. Uh, it's basically how I got my job at uh, uh, Microsoft. One of the reasons is I was uh, running a website at the time. And uh, so I could talk about it and show them the website and everything. And uh, uh, yeah, and you have uh, you all have access to the GitHub Student Developer Pack, which has unlimited private repositories. I think even by default now, GitHub has default uh, unlimited private repositories. So definitely use things like GitHub. I use GitHub for everything. I have almost all my stuff in there. Um, the stuff that's private is the stuff I'm private. Questions on plagiarism stuff? All right, cool. Yeah, that one sucks. Uh, we may update the syllabus, but we'll tell you about it. Um, yeah, this is uh, something that we care about, especially, you know, I think even this came in pre-pandemic, but during the pandemic, it's even uh, more important uh, to have a work-life balance. So, uh, you know, you gotta do your best. Like, uh, and we know like stuff comes up. The key thing is to talk to us about it early. 
the, the situation that can occur is a student struggles and they have you know work problems, relationship problems, whatever it is, and their grades start slipping and they start being late on assignments. And then it's not till the third assignment that they talk to us about it and tell us what's going on. And we it's kind of like a well, it's hard to go back, you know, three months and let you give you extra time on an assignment three months ago. Uh, so you know, just talk to us about it. Like we we're here to help you. Uh, we know things are difficult, so just talk to us. And we're reasonable people. Like it's okay. Like, I don't know. I try not to be scared, but I prefer otherwise. Okay, uh, Title Nine. So Title Nine is a um, is a law and university policy. So sexual harassment is something we take very seriously. Um, we are mandated reporters. That's something to know. So if, if we are aware of something, we have an obligation to report it. Um, there's a lot of good resources out there. You can find information about. Okay. Any questions on the syllabus? All right. Rest of the website quickly. Uh, there will be links up here when there's assignments. We don't have any yet. Uh, you go to the syllabus. The other part of the website is the schedule. So we have a Google Calendar here with the class schedule. Uh, so as professors, TAs, undergrad TAs have office hours and things, we'll post them on here. There's actually a very handy link at the bottom that you can add this to your Google Calendar. So you have all of these dates and everything. We'll also try to keep up to date with assignments when they're assigned, when they're due, these kinds of things. So this can help you stay organized uh, on the course. And then below that will be the links to all the class recordings. So this is October 11th, so that was Tuesday. So this is the link to the uh, recording on Tuesday, which is on YouTube, and links to the slides that were discussed in that class. So just after this class, there'll be one for Thursday that I'll post. And then, so this is where you can find recordings. They'll also all be on YouTube. Uh, so you can find them all there. It'd be weird to watch this while we talk about it. But yeah, question. I did mean Jane. Why did I say October? Hmm. I definitely messed something up. So thank you. Yeah, you look at that. It's a very well staged uh, thing. We did this back in October. We hired actors in here, to pretend to be students. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? Uh, say that again. Do you have any other So Tiffany and I, I mean, the, the office hours are what they are. If you need to meet with us in person for outside for whatever reason, just email I mean, email us to make up the outside post uh, and we'll schedule some. But yeah, usually, especially if it's about course stuff, it's always better just meet with whoever the next office hour is. And uh, that fits your time schedule. Um, also use Piazza and, uh, you know, it is, there's a ton of you. So if we, you know, we're to schedule even meetings with, I don't know, half hour meetings with a tenth of you, that's 50 a week, 25 hours a week to meet in person with people in class. Uh, so we, we typically don't, if it's an emergency, we can, we can hop on a Zoom if, you know, if it's something we're like, it's urgent, we gotta talk, whatever. Uh, yeah, but you know, we're, we're reasonable and flexible. Questions? Homepage also has more information. So it has uh, the sessions, the Zoom links, the TAs, I'm going to update this, uh, the office hours here as well. And we'll have some undergrad TAs, we'll have office hours probably. So our, the idea is to get office hours across the week and time so that, you know, you have, there's always some office hours you can go to. Uh, usually, oh, that's the other thing. It's usually with undergrad TAs, we've got an effective uh, they do like homework help sessions. So closer to the due date, they'll post things and we'll post those on Piazza when those are so and when and where. Uh, cool. All right, let's get into some content. Wow. We've talked about the course so much. All right. Uh, we're not gonna make it super far, so don't worry, but uh, there are things uh, we definitely wanna talk about here. So you're here. And of course, that's essentially about security. But what is security? Shouldn't we know what we're doing before we start it? How do you how would you define security? 
Making something safe, it's pretty good. What else? Yeah. Okay, so prevent uh, people that you don't want to reach things to be able to reach things. Yeah, that's a good one. What else? Yeah. Making sure that stuff is still available to people who should have access. Okay, making sure that stuff, like people who should be able to access things, uh, should be able to access them. Great. Uh, safety, somebody wrote on the Zoom, right, which is kind of implied in the keeping people safe, but or keeping things safe, but also kind of safety. The sec word security itself is very broad, right? You could think of uh, physical security, right? So you have Isaac cards that allow you to access in the different buildings in ASU. Uh, maybe an attack against this room for us to get access. If somebody tied a lock on the door, then we wouldn't have access to this room and that would disrupt things definitely. What else? Do you care about security? Some people are nodding their heads. Not all. So what do we mean by cybersecurity then? I'm going to get the Yeah. Uh, protection of data. OK, cool. So yeah, good. What else? Malware prevention. Malware prevention, so preventing malicious software from executing. Yeah, so the way I think about it is kind of cybersecurity is uh, anything to do or related to computers in some sense, right? So that could be uh, the computers, the networks, the Wi Fi networks. Um, we usually, you know, would stop at like physical security, except now things are kind of bleeding into each other. So we have um, now a lot of the physical systems, like, um, well, like Iran's uh, nuclear enrichment facilities are physical systems that are controlled by computers. And one of the things that uh, Israel and the US did uh, was create a uh, essentially a virus called Stuxnet that would propagate two machines until it got to a machine that it knew was connected to a nuclear enrichment facility and lie to the operator about what was happening, but have it spin and, and uh, shake at such a level that it caused uh, the machine to fail. But the operators didn't know what was going on because they look at the computer and they see everything's fine, but really this machine is being spin, spun to death. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I don't remember what the estimates I read were of how far back that put Iran's nuclear capabilities. But uh, the other problem is then that got out beyond the intended target and infected uh, some other machines and other uh, industrial control systems. So the line is often hard, hard to understand here or something like would you consider your car a computer? Yeah. How old of a car would you have to consider a computer? What about like a Tesla? You probably consider that a computer, right? It's kind of a big old console. You can start it remotely from your phone. What about like a 2001 Honda Civic? Yeah, so um, in 96, so engines are essentially controlled by computers. Uh, I think it's ECU, engine control unit or something like that. So there's been computers and cars for a long time. Uh, if you've ever seen any of the Fast and the Furious movies, like part of the reason why they'll hook a laptop up to those computers is so they can change the timings and everything of the engine to give themselves more, uh, more whatever. So yeah, like uh, anyways. Computers are basically everywhere. Uh, okay, but when we're thinking about security and the security of a system, uh, we usually want to think about three different aspects that are really important. And this is something to burn, burn into your brain of this, these three things. And it has a very easy acronym that you can use to remember it, and that's the CIA. So what we think about in terms of security is things like confidentiality. So confidentiality would be, like we said, uh, preventing people from getting access to things that shouldn't have access, right? So what types of data or information would you want to be kept confidential? Credit card data. Credit card data. Yeah, your credit card number, right? If somebody has your credit card number, they could use it and buy things and it would go to your account, yeah? Passwords, your passwords. With your passwords, other people can get in, yeah? 
Social security number, what can somebody do with your social security number? Steal your identity, which means what? That just sounds like a nebulous thing. Maybe that'd be great if somebody else just came in and started teaching this class and answering all my emails. What's the real problem with stealing your identity? They take out loans in your name that you're technically on the hook for because they don't know. They can set up, um, yeah, uh, what other things? Confidentiality is all good. Healthcare info. Healthcare info? Yeah, you want, maybe want your healthcare info private? Yeah. Social security number. What about your pictures on your phone? Your text messages? Your, um, what was that? Home address. What about your grades? Do you know that if one of your parents, your search, hey, that was a great one, yeah. Your search history. Yeah, do you know if one of your parents called me and said, I'm super worried about my son or daughter? Uh, they're in your 365 class. Uh, what's their grade in the course? I legally cannot tell them what your grade is because of confidentiality, student confidentiality laws. Uh, and so part of the things we think about in terms of confidentiality that we'll get into in the course is things like access control. Who can access what types of information? Uh, we also think about encryption. So we'll look at how we can use mathematics in order to keep the information secret such that I could literally send everyone in this room a file and you would not know the contents of that file, what's actually in that file, unless you knew uh, my secret key. Uh, the other thing, sorry, we're running a little late, but I need to sync up before we left on Tuesday. Uh, the other part, so the I part is integrity, and this is uh, integrity with, is about modifying or changing data. So if you think about people talked about, you may want to keep your bank, your bank information confidential. You may actually want the integrity of your bank account so somebody can't go in there and set your balance to zero, right? Some of you would think, wow, zero would be a great number in my bank account, but uh, many of us, that would be a bad thing, right? So the integrity there is really important. Um, and so we think about in terms there, how do we prevent people from modifying our, our information? And how do we specifically detect when somebody has altered our information? Those are actually two different kind of concepts there. So we have confidentiality, integrity. The third one, availability, which was what we touched on earlier. Um, and that's if we're able to deny somebody service or access that actually compromises the security. So this is when we approach and think about, okay, how do I secure system X? How do I secure this thing? I think about it in terms of these three things, confidentiality, integrity, availability. And that's it, we're done. I'll see you all online or on the video on Tuesday or in person if you want. <laughs>